Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Amos podcast, A Moment of Science, Please. We are joined today by Dr. Thompson, but first, my name is Robert and my co-interviewer. I'm Hawa. <laughs> and we would also like to acknowledge that this month, October of 2021, is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And with that, we are joined today by Dr. Thompson. He is a researcher with the chemistry department. His specialities are biosensor chemistry, microelectronic and engineering, and synthetic organic chemistry. He's a professor in the chemistry department. He teaches chemistry 414, which is the primary biosensors course. And he has also had a big hand in analytical chemistry course development. He is an academic associate at the Tyndall National Institute in Ireland, the University of Limerick in Ireland, and the University of Liverpool in the UK. And his current work includes sensor engineering and applied biosensing with a focus on biofouling. And uh, uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Thompson. No problem, it's my pleasure, uh, Robert and Howard. Yeah, so uh, with that opening done, we would love to move on to some questions. Our first question for you is, uh, if you would be able to summarize uh, your work uh, and your field, um, just give us a general overview. Okay, Robert. Yeah, you know, actually, I was very interested some years ago in you know general surface chemistry, and uh, uh, you go back a long time. I, I actually uh, was uh, interested in things like X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, which is a premier uh, surface analysis tool, going a long time ago. Uh, when Professor Siegbahn got the Nobel Prize for that, I was in that lab for a short period. And um, I got interested in how what proteins do on surfaces, because in that era, you know, there wasn't all that much known about these things. So over the years, I, I became very interested in uh, sort of initially in biomaterials, you know, how, what happens to some when you put something inside the body, what this what the body does to the device and, and what the device does to the body became a great interest to me. And then I sort of moved into the world of biosensor technology, which is a very, very related subject because you're dealing again with with the biological things on surfaces. And then I discovered over actually not that long ago, um, a few years ago, that uh, there was a major, major problem in terms of putting sensors inside the body in terms of what you call fouling in, in physical chemistry, they sometimes call that non-specific adsorption. It's the same phenomenon, really. Engineers have a different term for it. Um, <clears throat> and I realized, uh, I went to two or three conferences a few years ago, I was invited to speak there. And I found out that nobody, but nobody was putting their devices into biological liquids, despite the fact that, you know, they were, they were touting that they could do these measurements. So I decided to, 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 to change what I was doing and in the world of biosensor technology, move on to this, this issue specifically, which is a very, very challenging research issue. So it's been a progression from, you know, interest in surfaces all the way up to uh, what happens to surfaces in terms of biological, like, like blood and urine and, and cerebral spinal fluid in particular. So that's where, that's uh, sort of over the, some years of uh, the genesis of what I do, uh, Robert. Yeah, I remember uh, when I was taking chemistry 414 with you, uh, you mentioned that the importance of in vivo studies as opposed to uh, just just making sort of analytical me measurements in a glass, how it's important to measure with the actual body. Well, yeah, I, I, a few years ago, I went to, a, I was invited to give an opening lecture at the, uh, at the World Congress of Biosensor Technology. And so over three days, I think it was in Scotland, uh, in Glasgow, and um, I went to a lot of presentations and, you know, everybody's putting their device into uh, a buffer solution on a lab bench, which is next to useless, actually, in terms of practical application. And I thought, this is crazy, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, I asked these people, did you put your device into blood? Oh, no, I would never do that. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so that's how I, I tried to, I, I decided to make, uh, you know, and, and I actually had a couple of people in my research lab uh, until about uh, three or four, year, four, four years ago who were really made huge inroads into this issue uh, uh, solving it which as you know which I actually mentioned in chemistry 414 when you were taking that class Robert actually uh, you know the solutions to the problem um, so yeah it's uh, it's been uh, my passion for the last few years yeah so thank you so much for that and um, that's a great segue into our next question which is if you could think of just one maybe general maybe specific example of a lesson or a takeaway from, from your recent research or research career in general 
Uh, it's sort of aimed as a question toward our undergraduate population who has never really experienced research or has for certain, certainly, uh, including myself, never been a research sort of uh, professional. Is there any sort of general lesson uh, maybe leading away from your uh, sort of uh, criticism that you just mentioned where, where there aren't that many in vivo studies for biosensors? Uh, maybe, maybe there's a lesson there. Yeah, I think I think uh, you know my my feeling about that, uh, Robert, is uh, you know you have to do research on a on a challenging problem. Um, you know, over, over the years, there's been a spawning of hundreds and hundreds of scientific journals. I mean, uh, you know, which is publishing very often a lot of pretty pretty nothing nothing bad in the work, but it's just very mediocre. It's not not solving major challenges. Um, th there's not a day go by where I don't get 20 or 30 invitations to, to write papers for journal. Lit literally, I get about two dozen of these every day. You know, always oh, short one paper. I got five this morning, for example. Um, and uh, you know, looking at these, looking at this, some of these journals, what they're publishing is really very, very uh, you know standard sort of stuff. Uh, you, you know, incremental changes. So I've I've always tried whether whether I've been successful or not is other people have to judge. But uh, you know, it, it's it's to do a challenge and and be patient to because if you're going to if you're going to address a research challenge, for example, graduate students. Uh, you know, you know, you've got to be patient and, and you have to have some kind of, actually, I think the right word is courage, actually, you have to be sort of persistent and, and with courage because you're going to get a lot of negative results. If you've got a very challenging problem, it almost inevitably means you're going to have diff very big difficulties. Uh, but it's worth doing in the end, I think, uh, when you solve a problem, you know, you, you can make a change in a field and, and people will follow what you're doing. Uh, so I, th I think I think that's the message I will is is to be patient and have some courage and stick with it and 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 take on a challenge, take on a real research challenge, not just publish stuff uh, for sure the sake for, for the pure sake of it, which is unfortunately what's happening these days. You know, it, it's unfortunate, but uh, it's just the way things are. I guess people making money from journals is what it comes down to. You know, profit. Yeah, thank you so much for that answer. That's. Uh... I'm 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 glad we get to share some of your wisdom with the uh, undergraduate population. Um, the uh, if I could just jump in there. Oh, I think yeah, of course. Really, I think that's just really important in terms of any kind of research, not just analytical chemistry, because I think a lot of people, especially undergrads, are in such a rush to get something published or you know put their name on something, so they don't want to try the harder stuff. But I think that's really great advice. You should aim for something that's more challenging and then see what you can get from that. Because I, I think you said that in your classes, Dr. Thompson, that even a negative result is a is a result. Like you can still use that, right? A lot of your research, you've said that it may not be feasible, but it is important to understand it. Um, yes, well, no, that's right. Uh, actually, it's a very valid point. Uh, out, of, out of a group of negative results comes a big positive one eventually. It's, it's interesting you should say that. You know, one one of the I was thinking about the question what you as as we were just chatting here. One one of the things that's happened, I, I, I'd say something a little bit controversial here, is that it's a, it's now a world of marketing in in research. You know, people people are marketing what they do, and and sometimes uh, they they overstep the mark in terms of what what they've actually achieved and what they're actually. Uh, the importance of their work. This is this is unfortunate. From uh, and some academics, I'm afraid, are guilty of this. And even in our uni own university, uh, I don't think some people are going to like what I say there. But it, it, it's it's the truth. I mean, look at look at this um, this uh, Theron, Theranos case of this lady who uh, was purporting to do 200 tests on on a 10 microliters of blood or something. That's a classic example. She she ended up getting half a billion dollars in research funding. And it not not only did it not work or, or or was not you know kosher so to speak, she actually fabricated results um, or, or the, not necess her necessarily, but uh, some uh, you know. So it was all about marketing. She's a fantastic marketer, um, and I think this has been a, unfortunately an underbelly of uh, uh, this. Didn't didn't used to be the case uh, twenty some thirty years ago. It wasn't wasn't like that. But now. It's because the research pot is getting smaller for money, and because you've got a lot more researchers around now. Now they have to be very aggressive in terms of, you know, marketing what they do to get money. Uh, it, it's, uh, I, I think, 
some people might regard what I said to be controversial, but I, I stand by what I say there, actually. It's unfortunate. So um, I've tried to stick on the, you know, road of, uh, of a high challenge and, and, uh, and publish results when we, you know, get good res a good advance. So, you know, but uh, other people don't, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's a great answer. And um, I, I guess uh, a closing a closing remark on that could be as well, uh, especially in analytical chemistry. Sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's important to uh, rather than just uh, rather than just devoting your work to um, optimization of a method that you know works. Sometimes it's important to think of a new method of of analyzing chemicals and and um, analyzing analyzing systems, especially because. Uh, even if even if the method you come up with is not um, so optimized when you come out with it, and um, people are skeptical at the results it can actually generate, it's possible that this new method of sensing can can sort of open up new doors in the future. Oh yeah, that's absolutely true uh, of any technique, actually, Robert. Yeah, not just analytical chemistry. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So so now we'll move on to. Uh, uh, a paper that you published uh, a few years ago about the detection of breast cancer and prostate cancer. And um, what you do in that paper is you use uh, MPAS, which is a fusion of uh, a, magnetically, a magnetically oscillating sensor and a thickness shear mode sensor, which is uh, mechanically oscillating. And um, essentially, actually, maybe it might help uh, for our audience if you could give a quick overview of how. Uh, MPAS sensors work, and then I'll move on to my question. Yeah, okay. Um, there's, a, there's a bit of a story behind this, actually, Robert, uh, uh, which I think is worth telling, actually. Uh, I, I was uh, a, f a fellow of uh, Queen's College in famous Queen's College, University of Cambridge in England in 2001, 2002. And um, at, over there in that lab where I was working, there was a couple of grad students working on, on this technique that you're referring to now. But what they were doing was they were using uh, just glass. Uh, and what they were doing was putting metal coatings on the glass. I think it was aluminum, if I'm not mistaken. And what they were, what they were trying to do was some, some effect called magnetic direct excitation. So they were bringing an electromagnetic field close to it and the electromagnetic field was supposed to drive the metal into a vibration and then hence the glass basically that's what they were doing and they were having a huge amount of problem with it uh, in fact i was told by one of the professors there that uh, the student who got the phd thesis got results over two weeks of a three-year study there only worked for three two weeks which is really interesting <laughs> in its own right but um so i asked them then when i was there what if you use a piezoelectric substrate for this rather than uh, something non-piezoelectric like glass? And, and they said, oh, it doesn't work. We tried it, very, very short answer. Don't do it, it doesn't work. So I came back to U of T uh, and I, I actually went to see a couple of profs in the Department of Physics who've now retired, but um, I asked them about this and they said, yeah, you know what, this might work if you bring this, if you have this sp coil, coil, spiral coil where you're setting up the radio magnetic field, uh, radio field, and if you bring it very close to the quartz device, which, as you know, quartz is piezoelectric, Robert, if you bring this very close to the, uh, it may actually, there's, a, there's a, something called a secondary electric field, I won't go into the physics of this, but a secondary electric field associated with the coil that might drive this quartz into a vibration. That's what they told me. So I had a graduate student, a PhD student, who did his PhD on that very same thing. Uh, actually nothing else but that for four years, four and a half years. And he actually got it working beautifully. Uh, what actually happens is that the, the second electric field from the coil actually drives the quartz into, into a very high 50, 50th uh, um, harmonic. So you can drive it at a much higher frequency and therefore analytical chemistry a much higher sensitivity. So that's, uh, so as you well know by now, we've published quite a lot of work uh, actually using that. And right now, actually, we're using it to detect ovarian cancer in um, in uh, samples from uh, female patients who have that disease. So it's actually, you know, seen some real applications. But uh, for quite a long time, we actually were just using, studying, you know, how this work in collaboration with the physics guys who told us what to do. So the, the Cambridge people were wrong about that, basically. Uh, they didn't do the experiment properly, what it comes down to, you know. So that's the history of the MPAS device. 
Yeah, that that history actually covers uh, a lot of the questions I had. You know, because investigating um, investigating MPAS, uh, the history the history of the oscillatory sort of uh, sensor device is you used to have it anchored to a physical. I'm assuming a physical spring that you would actually drive the uh, set uh, the the surface up and down with, and uh, you would have. What they do with the t conventional TSM robot is they apply a bear, pair of, usually it's gold, it doesn't have to be gold, but it, it's usually gold. They get the quartz disc and then they put uh, on that um, some gold. And then there's an electrical connection to that, wires actually. Uh, and, and you can, you, you actually, it's, it's an alternating voltage you apply. So the thing, the thing oscillates, uh, usually about five to 10 megahertz in frequency. Uh, on the MPAS device, because you 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 have no electrodes at all; it's electro-free. So all the surface chemistry you're doing is on silica rather than on gold. That, that's a, a major difference. And and the, because you can operate at the 50th harmonic of say uh, 20 megahertz, you're ending up with one gigahertz, uh, which is you know 10 to the power six megahertz. So basically, uh, you get very high frequency and therefore very high sensitivity. That's how it works out. Uh, I should I should say it's not the simple thing to build. And uh, we, we, we were talking a couple of years ago to a, an American engineering company in New York who said that they'd love to uh, sort of do engineering design, let's call it that, on the system to make it look sexy and, you know, work, uh, you know, with, with, put it in the, in the hands of non-users and this sort of thing. But they wanted like about $3 million to, 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 to build that system, which is absurd. And we, we could never, I, I would never be able to get that kind of money from anybody to, to engineer a system like that, you know? So it's died on the vine because uh, we just, I mean, there's no way we can get that kind of money for engineering, you know? I mean, some people could, but I couldn't. So it's sitting there right now as a prototype, basically. Yeah, well, I mean, um, it, at least at least it's opened the door for, for future development. I love that, um, I love that you guys were able to overcome that sort of challenge by relying on sort of interdepartmental communication that the that talking to the physics department sort of uh, and collaborating with them helped you come up with a, a good answer to this question. And especially with what you're talking about with the um, 50th harmonic, I remember you uh, publishing that when you, when you sort of um, increase the harmonics, you do get better sensitivity and that the major problem with that in the uh, the thickness shear mode is that it would sort of destabilize the sensor and possibly and possibly uh, uh, corrupt your measurements. So it's yeah, no, uh, yeah. yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, going back to a point you just men mentioned, Robert, um, we we have a I, I have a, a collaboration with the Marie Curie Actions Program in Europe. This is a group of European universities, and they they've been sending people to my lab now for two or three years. And they've, they've taken the technology back to their lab, actually. So there's, there's four labs over there in Europe right now actually have built an MPAS system, actually, uh, um, almost along the lines of our design. And they're, and they're getting very good, re interesting results. So it has, it has spawned some interest. Uh, right now, actually, we have a, a young man from, uh, from the Komenius University in Bratislava, which is in the, in the Republic of Slovakia. He's with us for three months until, I think, the end of October or November. Um, he's been with us and he's doing MPAS studies. Uh, what they're doing, their interest, is to detect uh, bacteria in milk, actually. They have an issue apparently in East Europe with uh, getting contamination in milk. So he's using the MPAS, to, he's putting uh, optimas on the MPAS surface and, and, and uh, allowing them to interact with uh, the proteins on surfaces of e. e. coli and Staphylococcus in my lab right now, actually. But quite successfully, by the way, it's actually working quite well. So. And we put some anti-fouling chemistry on at the same time, which you, maybe you want to ask about later. So, uh, yeah, so so it has sped out quite a bit, actually. Uh, you know, awesome. Just... Yeah, the technology is traveling the world. Well, um, the next question will go to my co-interviewer, uh, Hawa, and she has a question, so I'll uh, defer to her. Okay. Yeah, so um, we talked about this at the beginning, but October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and you actually submitted a paper in 2020, and we just talked about this with MPAS, where you were able to use the system to detect ovarian cancer. Um, and so if you could provide a little bit more information on how you were able to use that technology and apply it to um, a real setting, so ovarian cancer detection. And do you think this is possible? I mean, could we detect breast cancer um, with the same kind of technology, do you think? Yeah, it's, um, 
basic, basically, how we, uh, the the original work we did on on detection of ovarian cancer was, uh, I guess, we published a paper that you're referring to about two years ago. I think that's a, the timing is right. Um, what we did, we had a graduate student who's still with me, by the way, uh, as a postdoc, uh, Brian de la Franier, who's an absolutely outstanding re young researcher. Um, basically, we we chose one of the biomarkers, you know, these ovarian tumors release uh, chemicals, which are known to, you know, biomarkers. There's a whole bunch of them, actually. But some of these are really, really poorly characterized in terms of the biology, never mind what we do. Um, so actually, uh, we pick one that, that, that correlated with the, the stages of the cancer. Um, as you probably know, things like ovarian cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer in guys, they, they have four stages of development pretty well. Um, the interesting thing about ovarian cancer is that uh, in stage four, it's a real killer. I, th I, think, uh, after, I think in women in that cate category, only one in five survive or something like that for five years. Whereas in stage one, uh, it's 95% survival, it's huge. So we actually picked a biomarker that actually would reflect the concentration and the stage of the development. So what we did was develop, we developed a spectroscopic method of doing that, which really wasn't biotech, biosensor technology, actually, as a matter of fact. And we successfully did that and published it. So the immediate attention, I was not surprised that we wanted to transfer that into the biosensor world. Which is what which, which is ongoing right now. Actually, I I have two two graduate student PhD students actually doing exactly what you're asking him here. They're doing that chemistry that was successful from a spectroscopic point of view. Now they're doing it on the MPAS system. No no big surprise there. And uh, we just I just appointed a brand new grad student. She started a, what a month ago, and uh, she's going to. She, she's going to be the one that takes the samples eventually from the hospital and, and check it out. And uh, the idea actually is to, is to screen uh, women uh, over, I don't know what age you hear, but uh, the incidence of ovarian cancer rises dramatically after about age 50, as you probably know. Um, so we, we would long to screen all women say once a year or maybe once every other year. But it's obviously has to be really cheap using system. I mean, you can't be having very expensive equipment doing that if you're going to survey, you know, a couple of million women in Ontario every year and you can't, you know, so, so the idea would be to have a biosensor working with a robotic uh, system in the hospital doing these things uh, almost without the human, human hand touching it. So basically, um, I think we're not that far off, actually, I would say within a couple of years, we will have the prototype working in our lab on terms of measuring. We, we, have a, we have a good collaboration with Princess Margaret Hospital, actually. Um, they, they have a very, very good international uh, ovarian cancer research unit at that hospital. And uh, so they have stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four blood samples from patients, which is really, really useful, actually. Uh, so we can actually eventually, we have not done that now, actually, but we are hoping within a year to two that we should be able to get some samples and then actually try them out. Right now we're working in things like uh, animal blood and, and serum, that sort of thing, uh, animal serum to test out what we're doing. So right in the middle of it, the question you're asking, we're right in the middle of doing it as well, we speak. If you're, if you're using animal serum, how does that work? Do you, do you provide the biomarkers into the serum or is it like, how does that work? Yes, yeah, that, that's exactly right. Uh, how we call it spiking. We, we take goat serum uh, or sheep serum or something like that. Uh, because, you know, the, the reason we do that is because in the hospital, when they're doing, you know, all the, all the various tests they do, most of it's on, on uh, human serum. It's not on blood itself. I mean, they do, they do actually do tests in whole blood, that, that's for sure. But uh, an awful lot of it is not, it's on human serum. Uh, they, 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 they spin down uh, the blood to get rid of the red cells and all, you know, the other debris in, in the blood. So they end up with serum. So I, I don't know what fraction of, um, I don't know what fraction of, you know, experiments they do, but it, it's very high. I would say probably 80, 90% using ELISA. Um, so we, we, we use uh, goat serum as a, as a basic. So we spike the serum with, uh, you can buy it. You can buy the biomarker, it's available. It's expensive, but you can buy it. And we just, we put a small amount at, at a known concentration in, in the serum and then we test that out. That's how it works. 
as a, a standard. Basically. Ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, but I think you've mentioned this, but do you think it's feasible to say like, in the next few years, there might even be the possibility of having like at home kits where you can use these sensors um, to test yourself? Or does it have to be, do you think, through blood samples or through biopsy samples? Um, and that no, would be I, th I, th I think it might be feasible. I mean, if you, go, if you look at this COVID situation uh, uh, and, and these other viruses, uh, uh, you know, um, how, uh, if you if you thought that two or three years ago, you would have said, "Oh, ne never going to be allowed to do that at the, in the home." But in fact, of course, as you well know, it is available for for the home now in the USA, in particular. So uh, the, the the thing I would say is never say never, <laughs> right? Right now, it looked like it would be pretty problematical. Uh, I think it would be more what we're doing would be much more aligned to the robotic methods in in the clin in the standard clinical biochemistry lab in hosp in hospitals. You know, in Princess, in in uh, Saint Mike's Hospital, where I, we work quite a lot with, uh, they do what is it? I think it's two thousand different determinations annually on about five million samples. It's absolutely enormous, you know. So a lot of ro robots there, robotics doing this, uh, you know. So uh, what we're doing would probably be much more aligned to that rather than a home test. But but you know, who knows? I mean, I don't see an empath ever being used in somebody's house, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, a spectroscopic system, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know. It's, it may be feasible, you know, but I don't think in the short term it would be. Yeah, I mean, hopefully one day <laughs> we'll see That's it right, in the yeah. future. Yeah, um, I think Robert has another question. Okay. Okay, Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm eager to get into the biofouling uh, side of things. So I read in your MPAS paper that, of course, biofouling causes a decrease in the in the frequency, which um, uh, you know that's that's a pretty that's a pretty good result because of uh, the way I would understand it is as you get non-specific absorption, you sort of get a, a slowdown due to the added mass under the sensor, um, and you also get a signal decrease, which is all, uh, of course problematic for. Um, actually measuring the biomarkers of uh, cancer metastasis. So what I'm wondering is uh, how long, and it can be how long in terms of time or how long in terms of the extent of nonspecific absorption under the center, uh, sensor, um, does the sensor take to be replaced? Like at what point would you consider the sensor to be quote unquote dead or unusable? And how does that impact the outlook of the sensor? Well, actually, Robert, it's almost unusable in, uh, almost immediately. Um, you, you know, take, take the example of ovarian cancer we've been talking about um, in, in serum, which was talking to a Howard about. Um, you, you have 45 milligrams per mil of albumin in, in serum, huge concentration of protein there. So as soon as, as, soon as you put, uh, actually, not only our device, but any kind of device into that m medium, the, the kitchen sink goes down on the surface. And uh, so even if you have a probe for the molecule you're interested in, like in our case, a biomarker for this form of cancer or any kind of cancer, um, you, you, you give you an idea, you're looking at 10 to the minus nine molar concentrations of the biomarker in serum for a patient in stage one, 10 to the minus nine molar. So you're trying to actually bind that onto a probe on the surface of the device it, 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 with a huge amount of, you know, many, many decades of protein higher concentration. So what actually happens, of course, is that it blocks the, 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 the chemistry that you're trying to do. Uh, so you, you, any signals you get come from nonsense on the surface, basically, to put it in, you know, colloquial language. So that's why in the last 10, 10 years, I've spent my career trying to avoid that problem, Try, trying to mix the probe on the surface, like an antibody or an aptim or whatever you put there on the surface. We're trying to mix that with a kit agent which causes, prevents fouling. That's what I've been trying to do for, 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 for the last 10 years. And uh, actually with a very significant amount of success, actually. So basically to cut a long story short here, Robert, the surface contains a probe for whatever we're trying to look at in terms of biomarker mixed in with something which causes anti-fouling. Uh, usually at a one-to-one -one ratio. That's what we do. And that's what we're doing in our impasse right now. In answer to Howard's question, we're, we're, we're looking at lysophosphatidic acid as a, as a marker for uh, ovarian cancer. 
Um, and actually, we, we have on the surface uh, got an agent that actually binds that very, very successfully. And so we combine also with this anti-fouling chemistry that we've developed in my lab over the last few years. Uh, and actually, it works as well. So, um, you know, we, we, we can, I don't think we can eliminate it entirely, but we have made a big strides in, in that field. And we've actually patented that as well, actually, subject to it. We've now been allowed a United States patent on the chemistry, as a matter of fact. So... Uh, they're hoping to commercialize this uh, actually very soon now, as a matter of fact, which is interesting. That's excellent. Yeah, I remember in your in your um, course on biosensing, there was uh, coverage of sort of sort of a, a bovine serum albumin as a as a method of preventing foul, fouling. And uh, I think um, because your your surface chemistry is very sort of, uh, I noticed that if you use a fragmented antibody. Um, you use a different sort of head group on the other sort of uh, sites in the surface chemistry, or actually I'm just going off a diagram in your previous study, but um, it's interesting how you can use sort of the surface chemistry um, surrounding the sites to sort of, I'm, I'm assuming, occlude the site from nonspecific uh, proteins, because you're right, what you're trying to do is uh, do very micromolar chemistry in an extremely noisy system that's populated with all these other uh, species. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, yeah, actually, the, 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 you're referring to there in terms of fragments of antibodies, as you know, we've done a lot of work on that uh, with, with respect to metastatic breast cancer, uh, uh, published that uh, a couple of years ago, Robert. Um, there, there was an intellectual question there, actually. Uh, um, sort of we going back to challenges, we were, we were interested in finding out if, if you slice an antibody apart and just take the site that you're interested in and put that on a surface, how that would compare with taking, taking the whole antibody and putting it down on a surface. That's, that's a question which has been asked in the literature a number of times by a number of scientists, you know, which, which is best. Uh, there, are some, there are some groups who feel that, that um, slicing, just getting the group that you're interested in from the antibody is very useful. You don't need the rest of the baggage, so to speak, with the antibody molecule. To do to do the surface chemistry, but uh, but, there, but there's another group of people who don't think that's correct actually that you need the whole antibody to, to function that the, the, the actual site you're interested in is, is actually controlled by the whole molecule itself not by a, by a, a fragment. So I, I decided to 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 to, to get to one of my grad students actually um, to to actually uh, sort of specific look at that challenge actually which is the case now, and you probably read the paper there you've seen what they we found actually it was sort of interesting that nobody's actually right <laughs> as, it, as it turns out there um and we actually found some of these fragments were actually quite anti-fouling which is in it, which is an added bonus actually which is what you're referring to actually yeah so uh, yeah that was uh Criviano Gaita in my lab a young lad from Romania who uh, actually came to my lab. Uh, actually, his parents were Romanian and came over here when she was a young boy. And uh, uh, I only mention that because I've been to Romania many, quite a few lots of times. I'm helping the government there with uh, some grant selection protocols. So it was nice to have a Romanian kid in my lab, actually, speaking the flu fluent Romanian language. Not that I have any Romanian language, but I can, I can buy a beer and a chicken dinner over there, but that, that's about it. <laughs> Perfect. That's all you need. Yeah. Well, um, you know, we have uh, we have uh, two more uh, short questions. I have another from uh, Hawa, and um, you were speaking before about how the U.S. government uh, allowed you to put a patent on um, your uh, anti-fouling procedures, which is, uh, you know, congratulations to you, by the way. Um, and Hawa actually has a question about uh, patenting. So, Hawa. Yeah, I mean, you you mentioned commercialization of the, the the science itself, right? The chemistry that you've you've created. Um, so I think some a lot of students wonder what the whole patent process looks like. I mean, if we're going to do research, are we going to get a patent? So I mean, if you could explain maybe the process, the time, what goes into getting a patent, and like, what do you need to for, to have a patent? Like, what what kind of research should you be doing if you're looking for a patent? Yeah, actually, there's almost uh, two questions in one there, actually. Uh, on, on, the, uh, on the dealing with the second one first on the process side, at our university has a really unusual uh, way of doing things. Well, I think that's fair to say that. Um, basically, 
when you write a patent to in co collaboration with lawyers, patent attorneys, uh, there's a significant cost attached to that. Uh, and, uh, you know, that can vary enormously from a very smallish patent up to something that's very complicated. But, you know, you can be in for $10,000 quite easily for, to do that. Um, and if you're writing two or three patents a year, like I am, you're up around 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars. So this is not feasible, right? I get paid very well by UFT. I don't get paid that well. Uh, so <laughs> basically, what happens is uh, you you uh, you have to disclose this to the university. You have to tell them I intend to write a patent on this. You have to do that. It's called a disclosure. And uh, they come back to you. The, uh, U of T, I don't know about other universities, but University of Toronto comes back to you and says, "Do you want to develop this yourself, or do you want us to do it?" Um, and basically, if, if you do it, decide, I, I will do this, I will pay for this patent, I will develop it, I will get all the money. The university then says, okay, run with it, and they give you 75% in the, of any profit in the future. And they walk away with 25% for doing absolutely nothing, basically. Um, that, that's that's uh, maybe a, a critical comment, but it, it's the truth. However, if they decide to you know, if they decide they're going to take it up as a university, they, they get 75% and you get 25%. That's the way the U of T works. Uh, I, I've never asked the university to actually develop it because I don't believe they could do that. So I, I actually uh, have done this myself and I've paid for these things out of my own pocket, actually. Uh, so then uh, going to the second part of your question, you know, the patent, uh, you, you, when you're doing research, you, you get the feeling, you know, from talking to colleagues, talking to people in industry, in my world in the medical industry, you know, that, that's of great value down the road, like the ovarian cancer test. If you're going to screen a lot of women that commercially would be of great value. Um, so you make that assessment, okay, is this, is this a commercial value? Okay, so then we, we have to protect the technology by, by making a patent on it. And, and normally I've become quite adept at writing patents. I understand the way they, they set up. Not everybody can do that, but I've, I've, I've got 22 patents. So I actually, you know, got because I'm an old guy, right? I was so I got used to. <laughs> I know how to do these things. Um, so then we write it up, and you put it in the hands of a, a patent attorney who puts it all in their legalese language and everything. And then it's it sent to, uh, in our case, it was the USA and Can Canadian patent officers, also charging money, by the way, for looking at these things. Um, and then it takes it takes a while. They examine it, and then they. They sometimes come back and say, well, this is not, this has been done before in the literature. They always argue that. And now you have to argue back that, no, it's not. And they, there's a backwards and forwards with the US patent office. And then eventually they allow the patent. That's how it works. So that, that's the process side of it. And that's the patent side of it. And uh, we've been successful in, quite successful in, uh, you know, getting patents allowed in both Canada and the USA, actually. We don't tend to apply in Europe, which we should, but uh, the European patent office is very, very expensive, you know, can be. Uh, it can be really many, many thousands of dollars, which we just don't have, unfortunately, you know. So when once you have the patent, then, then you have to start looking for investment money on the commercial side of things, which is always very difficult, you know. Uh, but we have some level of investment and we're looking for investment right now in our ovarian cancer project, actually, we're actually going out. We're actually talking to people right now, as a matter of fact, on, the, on that. So who knows what will happen, but hopefully within a year or two, we'll be funded to, to do some uh, development work and actually make this work for women in the next two or three years or four years. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's absolutely great. Um, just to see that you, you can play out research, you know, I think a lot of people associate research with just like doing the work, but there is this commercial business aspect to it that, that you could benefit from on the side as well, right? All your hard work isn't just you're not just getting a paper published. <laughs> no, that's that's true. I mean, not not everything's like that. Of course, pushing back uh, pushing back the frontiers of knowledge is what what we do as well. But um, you know, I mean, I mean, it, it turns out that some of the things I do have in, do have commercial uh, interest. You know, anywhere where you're trying to develop medical tests, for example, is good. There's a there's a business there attached to that. You know, not that, but not everything we do. When we were doing the studies uh, a few years ago of this fouling problem, it was very academic to start with, you know, we were using things like molecular dynamics and neutron reflectance spectrometer to figure out what was going on. It was very, very academic. But the end results, we did, we did come up with something that was commercializable, actually, which is interesting. And we're in the middle of that right now, actually. 
Yeah, that's great. Um, okay. Congratulations on all your projects um, and your patents so far. But we have one more question um, and we asked this to all of our guests. Um, and so we wanted to ask you who your favorite scientist was, if you could name one. <laughs> <laughs> who my favorite scientist was? Well, actually, uh, the, I, I sort of a somewhat long winded answer to that question is that, you know, it depends on, on um, the impact that you think somebody has, has made. Uh, and and uh, you know sometimes uh, you can look at really quite older older guy scientists, uh, but I I, I have to say uh, that uh, it it would be Isaac Newton actually uh, it would, would be my favourite scientist. This is clearly not somebody who's alive and working today, but uh, in terms of impact, uh, you know, and uh, he's British of course, which is which is uh, <laughs> very fond of the British guys, but I I think. Uh, he was uh, uh, his impact was absolutely immense. Actually, I think uh, Isaac Newton. Uh, he had. Uh, I, I would have to say uh, he he would be my favourite of all scientists. So, but this is going going back, uh, you know, quite a, quite a long time, of course, you know. But I've read about a lot about his life and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, with an interest in uh, physical chemistry like I have, I uh, I can't I can't get enough of. Uh, his physics and and reading about his contributions as well so I can definitely sympathize with that yeah well uh Dr. Thompson uh thank you so much for joining us today it has been a pleasure and we are very honored that you have uh come on and given us your time to talk to the uh, undergraduate students who listen to our podcast and uh we have been very thrilled with this interview so thank you so much Okay, no problem. It was a very, it was a great pleasure, guys. I hope I uh, hope I did a decent job answering your questions. <laughs>